We're going to talk to Brian. We're going to talk to Brian. Let's see if I can answer Brian. I don't know who let me run the controls. It was probably a mistake. Hi, Brian. Mm -hmm. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to the Atheist Experience. What would you like to talk about today? Hey, guys. Um, are you talking to the Brian from Maryland? I'm talking to you. If you are, in fact, the Brian from Maryland, I didn't really look at the call screening. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, guys, um, this is my first time calling. I'm a little nervous. I have anxiety, but I'm, I'm going to try to get through it as best I can. I kind of wrote some stuff down here. Um, but just a little background. Um, I am a, I, I guess I could label myself as an agnostic theist, but I've heard people say that, uh, well, it's, I don't know. You're, wait, no, no, never mind. <laughs> Dan and I aren't big on labels, so we care more about what you believe, and labels right. aren't that important. Yeah, we're not going to berate you because you didn't, uh, right. you didn't choose what we perceive as the right label for yourself. Just describe what your beliefs are, and and we'll go from there. That's a more productive way for us to chat. Okay, cool. Don't be nervous. Right. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm. I was raised in Christianity, um, more so non-denominational Christianity. I wasn't raised Baptist or um, Episcopal or anything like that. Um, and there was the the main thing that was um, talked about every Sunday was um, God's grace, you know, His salvation and you know, you know, stuff like that. Not really, you know, the Old Testament wasn't really brought up much. Um, it was here and there, but um, basically I just wanted to call you guys. Uh, I've been wanting to call you guys for fairly, a fairly long time. And I've, I've done some research about, you know, secular morality. And I, I called um, recovering from religion and I had a good talk with the gentleman there. Um, okay. I, I'm just questioning my beliefs and I've, I'm, I'm 23 years old. I've been a Christian for a while. I, I, I won't, I won't say that I'm, I'm completely an atheist just yet. I'm, I'm still an agnostic theist. Um, but, that happens. Um, yeah, my, go ahead. Oh, I just said that happens. So, yep. so is there something specific? Because we don't have a, a great deal of time, and I want to make sure that I'm focused enough on what's important to you. So is there something specific that you'd like to address with us or go over with us with regard to your deconversion and something you're struggling with? Yeah. So, um, so my first question is, um, how can any human, um, prove that science is reliable? I mean, I, I know, I, I know that Matt has said, um, that, you know, science is proved through its demonstration through reality and stuff like that, which I can understand, but you know, there's some things that I just don't know. It, I just don't understand how some scientific claims and, and theories and consensus is, um, can be reliable. Okay, Paul, did you want to go first? Sure. So first of all, of course, science is grounded on a few things that we are having to assume. For example, we, we assume that the, the natural world exists. We assume that, um, that we can learn things about the universe, that it operates in such a way. But those are the very few assumptions that we have to make. And so if you want to talk to someone who, you know, wants to insist that the universe doesn't exist and that we can't learn things about it, well, then you're kind of done. But what science <laughs> really does well, um, and the the so truth is the extent to which a proposition conforms to reality. That's a thing, thing people rattle off. But I always add on the end, as adjudicated by predictive power, because of course, how well does one conform to reality? Maybe my eyes are failing me and I don't understand that the wall behind me is blue instead of you know pink or whatever. Um, so what we use is predictive power. And predictive power is the sole scorecard. So in order in science for something to be considered um, reliable, and, and we don't use the word proof in science, we use the you know other words like we're confident, um, it's by making a prediction. Right. So if I see a door in front of me, I don't just say, oh, well, I, there's obviously a door. If I see a door in front of me, I predict, oh, I should be able to open it. I should be able to walk through it. If I, you know, if, right. if I use other mechanisms and if any of those fail, then my proposition that there's a door in front of me, even if I'm seeing it, you know, becomes less reliable, right? So really, and we covered this right. a little bit with the previous caller, it's all about predictive power, making unique predictions of future data. 
Um, and this can even be done with history. It can be done with forensic science, for example. Like you might say, okay, we have suspect X. And if it is suspect X, we expect to find these other bits of evidence. And, and for example, you might be able to find evidence of where they were, or you might be able to find evidence that they had a certain sized shoe. Like uh, even when we're looking backwards, right. we make predictions. So that is right. largely how science is. That's the scorecard for science. How well does it predict future data? Does that make sense? Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Cause um, I, I have this hard time distinguishing whether science is the, um, the confirmation of ab absolute certainty or whether it's just, you know, the, the best, uh, the best assumption or the best, uh, how can I say this? The best, um, I don't know. Like, kind of like well, we, science doesn't, as I mentioned, science doesn't deal in certainties at all because, you know, there's right, always right, new yeah. data to be learned. Science deals in what is the best current explanation for the phenomena that we've seen so far. And so yeah. proof is limited to right. mathematics. Really, outside of mathematics, we really shouldn't almost use the word, you know, in a philosophical sense. So if you're looking for absolute certainty, no real, no scientist would claim that, even for what we call the laws yeah. of science, right? The laws of, phys of the universe. We just label those as things for which we've never seen. We've, we've never observed anything different yet. We even leave that open, right? So right. if I've dropped my pen 10,000 times, we, we assume the 10,000 at first will, will work, but we don't say that we've proven that in advance. Right. It's essentially the most robust philosophical model that we currently have for testing predictions about reality i mean maybe you right. if, maybe one day somebody will have a better one but nobody's come up with a better one yet yeah. um it, so it, but i'm not right. sure where that right. factors into your theism which is interesting to me or or right. your the complex relationship that you have with a, a potential deconversion from theism so may i ask why you had the question about science yes so i don't know I, I know Matt Dillahunty, he's, he's hung up on, well, it was years ago, but he hung up on a guy who claimed to be a solipsist, but I don't, I don't know what solipsism means. Solipsism means I don't want to think that I'm a solipsist, but the, the mm -hmm. thing is like, I don't think that I'm going crazy or insane, but I'm literally doubting every single thing, not just my beliefs and faith, but, um, you know, the, <laughs> I'm, I'm doubting the reliability of science, you know, astronom astronomical physics, stuff like that. Um, do, you, do you think that one of the reasons that you might be doing something like that, Brian, is because you've realized that you held a belief structure over time that you held without necessarily seeking hard proof. And now you realize that belief structure itself ha had a falsification falsification criteria that it didn't meet for you. And because it didn't meet that falsification right. criteria for you, you have concerns now that whatever, wherever you land is going to create the same problem for you. So now you're seeking certainty as a solution to that problem. Right. Yeah. That, that's basically what it is. Yeah. I would say so. Brian, so many of us go through that. I was there. So many of us go through that. Like when you realize that, first off, I just want to acknowledge to you that you are not alone in this. You are not going crazy. This is a normal yeah. thing that happens when people go through the deconversion process or, or even go out of one religion and into another. Sometimes you realize that you had believed something maybe for not the best of ideas and you don't ever want that to happen to you again. So you b become laser focused on making sure that the next thing that you believe or whatever you reconstruct is absolutely correct. But then you can go down, especially if you're smart and especially if you're somebody who is focused on finding the truth, you, go, you drill right down to the philosophical baseline and then you get to well can we ever be certain yeah. about anything and that yeah. can cause you to have angst because well then what can i be certain about but you're <laughs> focusing down so far right now that you're getting to the core philosophy of how we even adjudicate what we find to be true in the world 
So a better question to maybe right. ask yourself instead of, can I be certain about anything at all would be, how can I best function? Like what, 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 what can I do in my life so that I have the best facts av available to me in order to function appropriately in the world because you need to take care of yourself, right? So right, maybe right, yeah. don't get caught at the philosophical baseline of, well, now how can I know anything? Because there are certain ways that you can right. know things with a high enough degree of confidence that you can, you can land in the presuppositional space with it. Like the universe exists, that so you exist, for example. These are things that you can know with confidence or at least you can affirm confidently. So I don't know if that helps at all, but I, I hope it does help to know that you are not the only one that this has, that this happens to so many of us. <laughs> does, it, does it seem like I understand yeah, you? I didn't want to misinterpret you. Oh, no, you. I, it, it sounded like you understood me pretty good. And every, everything you said was pretty spot on. And uh, that, that helped pretty, pretty good. Um, oh, good. I'm glad um, I could help. So, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, do, do you guys have time for another question or... I think so. Yeah. If, if I don't know about Paul, but who cares anyway? I'm I'm, 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 I'm pulling rank. <laughs> go ahead, Brian. One more yeah, question. I'll let you go. Question. Sure. Okay. So this is about, um, secular morality. Um, oh. I could never really get any information about secular, secular morality. I, I've tried watching, uh, Matt talk about it, but I, I just, I couldn't understand it. Um, and, the thing is, I find myself still labeling myself as a Christian because I find myself believing, well, first off, I, I do agree that God isn't a moral God. Right. Um, but the thing, like with, with slavery and, you know, the, the flooding of the earth, killing those millions of people, that that was by all means. <laughs> <immoral>. <laughs> yeah. um, but the thing is, I don't understand why. But the New Testament morals um, that Christ promoted and his sacrifice and him dying on the cross for humanity, um, that just, I, I don't understand how that is less superior or inferior to secular morality. And that I've heard people say, you know, well, secular morality and the morality that Christ promoted are, are on the same lines. I've heard that mm -hmm. before. But I, I still don't know how it's possible. Would you agree, Brian, that uh, Jesus' morality teachings can be summed up with the two commandments that he professed? So the first being, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second, he said, the second was like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Would you agree that that kind of sums up uh, Christian morality in the New Testament? Um. I mean, I, I would say so, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. how Jesus summarized it. That's what he said if it comes down to these. Now, the first one, love your neighbor, or love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and your, all your mind. Um, that's the one that atheists don't use, or secular people <laughs> don't use. Can we leave that one out. <laughs> um, and so right. what we focus on, uh, and now we didn't get to it via Christianity, this, this golden rule, this idea of empathy existed Confucius talked about it hundreds of years before Jesus existed. It existed as far as we know forever. Um, love your neighbor as yourself, and it would be better phrased as love your neighbor as they would choose to be loved. Um, would you agree that that right. pretty much anything, can you think of anything in your moral system that that wouldn't fall under that category and also couldn't then be attributed to mere just empathy? Right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, so the trouble is that Christians get in trouble when they use that first one, when it's the love the Lord your God ahead of empathy. That's actually when some of the problems come in, because then we decide, oh, certain behaviors. I, I'm if I'm interpreting the Bible right, God doesn't want me to do certain behaviors, even though that might hurt people. So I'm going to use that to override. Or, you know, maybe I need to fly a plane into a building. Like, all these things, the problems come with that first one. So if we stick to the second one, we have a secular morality and, frankly, a morality that 
intuitive, and I, I don't use, I like to use the word intuition, but it's what Christians tend to do when they cherry pick the Bible is they tend to just right. focus on that second commandment. So if you just take the first one away, yeah. we kind of all agree on, on great ways for us to thrive in a society. That's, yeah, that's most... basically the essence of secular morality. Yeah, that's a really good point, Paul, and I hadn't thought about it before, is that most monotheistic religions, their systems of morality insist that we prioritize God over each other. And yeah, that causes a lot of problems. So when you remove yeah. him, that leaves us prioritizing each other. And us prioritizing each other clearly doesn't require a God. We, we, we can understand through how we've interacted over time, how we operate in societies that are mutually beneficial and that, that being good to each other and doing things that benefit each other and us as a group as a whole that help protect our species, help us individually flourish, help us be happier, help us have more productive societies, all of those things you can kind of look at sort of empirically and understand that there's outcomes related to certain ways of behaving uh, towards one another. And if you can understand that there's outcomes that you would measure as positive, whereas, whereas there's also outcomes you would measure as negative and then attach those to how we interact with one another, then bingo, bingo, you got a moral system no God required. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would that be problematic to you somewhere? Yeah. Would it be problem problematic to me? Yeah. Do you see like do you see a yeah. problem with the Paul or, or my descriptions there somewhere that you would have an objection to that requires the injection of a deity? No. No, I, I, I don't necessarily think that we need a, a god for a moral system. But okay. um well no. No, 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 no. Hold on. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that. Okay. Yep, you got me. Yep. Right? Yeah, Believe me to think. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm guys. I'm I'm just searching and I'm just trying to figure all this out. I'm, but I, I really appreciate you taking my call. Well, I, hope I appreciate yeah, you searching thing. with us, Brian. I'm glad that you felt comfortable enough to call and go over this with us and, and hear us out as well. So we appreciate talking to you and thank you very much. Feel free to call back and let us know where you stand later on, okay? All right, cool. That sounds good. See you guys. Thanks, Brian. We appreciate you. See you later.